As more and more engineers adopt microservice architectures and cloud-native technologies, understanding the behavior and failure patterns of our systems is key to ensure they are performing and delivering a great customer experience. Yet, it is really hard because those environments are highly dynamic with auto-scaling and frequent deployments of new versions of our applications. I'm Ramon Gil, VP of Observability Products at Timescale, and in this CNCF webinar, I will show you how you can use three open source projects, OpenTelemetry, Grafana, and PromScale, to get insights about your systems that will help you deeply understand how they behave or misbehave so you can improve them and deliver a better experience to your users. This is the agenda. First, I'll do a very quick introduction to open telemetry and distributed tracing. Then I'll talk about PromScale, which is a free open source observability backend that runs on top of TimescaleDB and PostgreSQL. And finally, I'll show how you can use open telemetry, PromScale, Grafana, and SQL to better understand your distributed systems by using a demo environment we've created that you can get up and running on your computer in just a few minutes. The demo environment we will use is available on GitHub at the URL that you see at the top. And we've also written a detailed blog post that covers everything about that demo environment, how to set it up, how to instrument your code with open telemetry and how to query the data and build Grafana dashboards. I'll be covering some parts of that in this session. If you want to dig deeper, I recommend you check that blog post. You ready? Let's get started. For those that are not familiar with it, I'm going to take a few minutes to introduce open telemetry and distributed tracing. Open telemetry is a new standard for instrumentation that is hosted by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It was born after two other open source projects joined forces, Open Tracing and Open Census. In the three years since the joint effort was announced, OpenTelemetry has become the second most active project, as well as the second with most contributors among all CNCF projects. Only after Kubernetes, but well above Prometheus and other very popular projects. Most observability vendors, including us, Timescale, and all major cloud providers are contributing to the project. Why is there so much interest in it? Well, first, it's vendor agnostic. Instrument once and send telemetry anywhere. So your investment is future proof and behind are the days where you had to re-instrument your systems when adopting a new observability tool. It also opens the door for engineers creating libraries, frameworks, and tools that other developers use to build their applications to add instrumentation into the source code. For example, Kubernetes has started adding open telemetry instrumentation into their code. Second, it's a standard that includes the three key telemetry signals, metrics, logs, and traces that share the metadata and tags so you can more easily correlate them. It also defines align protocol and semantic conventions, making interoperability between open telemetry and other tools much easier. And finally, it provides libraries that do automatic code instrumentation, dramatically reducing the effort required to instrument your code. In today's session, we will focus on open telemetry traces, since they hold a lot of valuable data to understand distributed systems that metrics and logs cannot provide. But what is a trace? A trace is a connected representation of the sequence of operations that were performed across all microservices involved in order to fulfill an individual request. For example, if you open an article from a new site in your browser, there would be multiple operations served by different microservices. Read the article, read the comments for the article, and request ads to display with that article. Each of those operations are represented by a span with their own subspans. 
A span can have zero or multiple children. All spans have just one parent, except the initial span in a trace, called the root span, which has no parent. Some of you may be familiar with Yaga, a popular open source distributed tracing product. This shows a screenshot of the Yaga UI, which includes an individual trace with all its span under parent-child relationships. In the demo, we will make heavy use of PromScale and its capabilities. PromScale is an open source observability backend for metrics and traces powered by SQL. As I mentioned, it's built on top of the proven rock solid foundation of TimescaleDB, which is a time series database built on top of PostgreSQL. And as a result, it lets you query the data using full SQL. We will use SQL extensively to derive insights from traces in our demo. On top of OpenTelemetry, PromScale also integrates with Prometheus for long-term metric storage and analysis, with Grafana to visualize the data, and also other tools like Yaga, which we saw before. This is just a high-level architecture where you see PromScale using TimescaleDB to store the data and integrations with Prometheus, OpenTelemetry, Grafana, Yaga, and any tool that speaks SQL. As a note, TimescaleDB is PostgreSQL with time series superpowers. Technically, it's a Postgres extension and so also gets access to all the capabilities Postgres provides. Enough of an introduction, let's start playing with OpenTelemetry, PromScale, Grafana, and SQL. You can get this demo up and running on your own computer. You need to have Docker and Docker Compose installed and then download the GitHub repo and run Docker Compose up. This is what the three commands in this slide do. I'm going to copy and paste them into a terminal so you see what happens. So as you can see, this has cloned the repo, and then I just run Docker Compose, which will download all the different uh, images, build them, and, um, and then get the environment up and running. This will take a few minutes, so we're not gonna see all of this now, but uh, you can do it on your uh, laptop, and it, we've tested with uh, Mac OS, Linux, and Windows. So going back to the slides, this is the high-level architecture of our demo system. It's a password generator that has been over-designed as a microservices application connected to an open telemetry observability stack. It has a load generator that makes requests to the generator service. Then the generator service calls the upper, lower, digit, and special services to get random uppercase, lowercase, digits, and special characters to build a password. The lower, the lower service is written in Ruby and the rest in Python. All services have been instrumented with open telemetry traces and send those traces to PromScale. As we saw before, you know, you can get this demo up and running uh, on your own laptop. Okay, now, now let's go into Grafana and let's check uh, all the different dashboards that we've built that will show how to use SQL to derive insights from tracing. So here I'm already logged in and I have a demo environment that has been running for uh, quite a bit. Uh, by default, the demo environment comes with these six uh, dashboards uh, and we will be uh, looking at them now. One thing to keep in mind is that the first time you try to log in into Grafana, it will ask for your login and password, and those are admin, admin. Okay, these are the defaults uh, that are set. You can change them if you want, but since this is for demo purposes, you know that's not as important. So we're gonna start by looking at uh, the request rate dashboard. The request rate dashboard is 
uh, just uh, simply showing the uh, number of requests per second that are happening uh, across you know the uh, the microservices. Since this is a um, uh, since uh, the architecture, if you check the architecture of the uh, of if, if we check the architecture of the um, application, we'll see that there is basically one entry point, which is the generator. Okay, so this is basically measuring the request throughput for um, the generator. Uh, the throughput, you know, request per second, is one of the uh, golden metrics when measuring application performance. The other two are error rate and latency, which we will be looking at next. But here, let's take a look at how these dashboards are built. So let's, we can take any of those two. Let's take the, uh, the one at the bottom. So you'll see, this is a standard time series component from Grafana. And what we're doing is, we're doing this SQL query, okay? So you see, you recognize the select from where close. In the select, what we're adding is we use the uh, timescale db time bucket function. This creates buckets to be displayed, so it aggregates that we, we then uh, group by the time bucket. So this basically aggregates data on a per second uh, bucket. And then we're doing counting everything that is happening, you know, within the bucket. So that gives us the number uh, of requests. So we're counting all the spans, uh, since that's what we have in the from close, we're, we're uh, querying spans. Count star is giving us all the span that meet this requirement, you know, where, you know, parent span ID is now. So these are, you know, entry requests into the system, which as I mentioned, are basically requests to the generator service. And so this is the, uh, this is the throughput that we see, you know, it, it comes in, in sort of waves and we see, you know, max is getting to uh, 11 requests per second, but we also see in some buckets there are no requests at all. Okay, now we're gonna take a look at, um, we'll take a look at another dashboard. We'll look at the error rate dashboard. So this dashboard, I think it gets a little bit more interesting than the other one. So the other one was obviously showing the evolution of throughput over time, but this one is, give us, uh, is giving us more detail. This one, for example, if we look at, let's focus on this table. This table is telling us for each service and operation, what's the error rate? You know, how many, what's the percentage of errors, you know, across uh, all these operations that happen in the system in the last, uh, in this case, 30 minutes. So let's take a look at what this query looks like. So this is what this query does. It looks at, you know, it retrieves from, um, so it's using a subquery. Again, this is an interesting thing. You know, it's something that is available in SQL, but not necessarily, you know, in other query languages for, uh, or, you know, that observability tools offer. And so in this case, we have a subquery. We have a, an initial query that is doing a select again on the span view. This is a view that we the prime scale exposes, but you can think of it as if it was a you know regular table. Doesn't matter that much for for the purposes of uh, explain the SQL that we use. So we're querying the span view, and in the span view we have a service name which is, you know, again, name of the service, play the explanatory, a span name. A span name is typically the name of the operation, okay? It's the name of the span, but what it indicates is the name of that specific operation. Then we have, we're counting how many of those spans have a status code of error, and we're also counting the total number of spans. And we're grouping by one and two, that means that you know we're grouping by service name and span name. So these these two statistics are calculated grouped by service name and span name. That that's why we see you know this in what we see in this table. And uh, and then we're also we're using you know two variables as filters. Okay. So if we go up, because we as I said this, this is a subquery. So we have the we have these results, and then the only thing this other query is doing. It's just taking service name, span name, 
and then calculating the rate, the error rate. Okay, we could have done actually everything within the same query, but you know, to make it easier to read, we just used a, a subquery. And finally, we're ordering, ordering by error rate descendant. So we show those uh, operations that have a higher error rate at the top. Okay, so with this information, very quickly, we can see, okay, so generator generate is the one that has a higher error rate, but that is the top level operation. So let's focus on, you know, next level. And next level, we'll see uh, process extra, extra process upper is the other one that has a very high error rate. There are some other operations that have um, some errors, but they are, the, the, the error rate for those is much lower. So probably, you know, we should go and focus in this, you know, check this method and see what's going on, why we have such a high error rate. Um, as, uh, as we mentioned, you know, you, you have here at the top, if you wanted, you could actually filter down to some, to some specific uh, service or, uh, or, or operation in here. The other thing we're doing here is that we're looking at the uh, evolution, you know, this is a similar to this, but this is looking at the evolution over time. So if you, if we open this query, we'll see that the query is pretty much the same. The main difference is that we're introducing a time uh, variable here, a time um, uh, projection in the select. That is the time bucket, you know, so we're calculating this stat, the, the error rate per service and operation uh, in a, you know, an upper minute basis. And we're plotting it here over time. Okay, let's move to the next one. Let, the next one is latency, okay, request durations. This is the third golden sign. -off. So as I said, there are three. So we have uh, throughput, uh, error rate that we've already seen, and then latency. And here we can see let, let's look at this chart here. This chart is showing the evolution of duration over time, but we're not looking at average. We're actually looking at percentiles. Okay, so we're computing percentiles. So how does this work? Well, again, let's take a look at and see how the query works. So here again, we're using this time bucket function that TimescaleDB provides to group uh, um, the data in buckets of one minute. So then it shows you know in the, in the group by close, and then. What we're doing is that we're looking at the uh, percentiles for a uh, 99th percentile, 95th percentile, 19th percentile, and the median or 50th percentile. And to do that, we're using the approx percentile function provided by TimescaleDB, which looks like the, the, we use this percentile act function as well, which um, calculates a sketch on the duration millisecond, which is a data structure that then allow us to compute an approximate percentile on top of it in a way that is, you know, more performant. And then you are just plotting all of those here. So again, you know, we can use the power of SQL and TimescaleDB DB to compute those percentiles. And we could use any, we could compute any percentile that we wanted here. Another thing that is uh, interesting is this histogram of durations. Okay, so if we look at this, this is showing us the distribution of latency for uh, uh, for requests again, because all requests go through the generator. You know this is for you know all all generator requests. There is just one um, entry point into this microservices environment. And what we see is that while the majority of the uh, requests are processed in let's say maybe let's say two seconds or less, there are some of those that are extremely slow. You we even have requests that took, you know, 30 seconds. That's that's a lot of time. What may be going on there? Okay, so here at the bottom, we have another interesting thing. Here we're listing individual traces. So again, a trace maps to our request and, and how it flew, uh, how, you know, it went through the system. So we're looking at individual traces when they happened and how long they took, okay? And this query is actually showing the slowest one. So let's take a look at this. So if we look at it, we'll see that we have a number of 
uh, traces, you know, the start time duration, as we saw in the uh, uh, in the panel, in the dashboard. And this is what we're doing. So we're talking, we're displaying the trace ID, okay? And we're doing this replace text that I'll, I'll explain why we're doing this. We have the start time and the duration that we're projecting. And the only thing we're doing is just sorting, okay? So we are using again span id null which means this is you know the root span and basically maps to a trace a full trace and um and the only thing we're doing is we're just sorting okay so it's a very simple query we're just searching for root spans and uh we're getting the top 10 that the slowest one right because we're sorting by duration descendant so we're doing this replace thing. Why are we doing this? So the um, trace IDs, when they get stored in prompt scale, they have they use a UUID format, so they have dashes in them. But you'll notice that this uh, trace ID here is underlined. This is because this is a link. We've made this a link. And so we're actually, if you click on it in any of those traces, we'll open the Grafana UI to show the distri an individual distributed trace, which is similar. It basically reuses the code from Yager. And so with this, you know, you don't need to copy and paste the trace ID. Well, you can actually just use this linking a smart thing that we use thanks to you know, the amazing capabilities that Grafana provides that are very flexible. You can jump straight into that slow trace and you can check and try to understand what's going on. As you see, you know, mo there are a lot of those spans that are very quick. But there are always, you know, a few of them that are slow. And if you check closely, you'll see that those that are slow actually belong to this um, digit. And actually, it's the random digit function that it's slow. Okay, you can uh, see it, you know, very quickly here. So you could actually go back to your code, the random digit um, method or function in your code, and check, you know, try to understand, you know, why that is a slow. Okay, so very quickly with nail down that the problem is related to this specific function. At least in this trace, you know, we could look at other traces and see maybe the problems would be different. But in this case, you know, that is that is the problem that is causing this trace to be slow. Okay, let's go back to our dashboard. And now let's take a look at something even more interesting. Service dependencies. And so this is a service map and it helps us to quickly understand how our different services interact. For this dependency map, we're using Grafana's node graph, which at the time of this webinar is still in beta. So let's take a look. As you can see, we're using here the node graph. And the node graph uh, panel from Grafana expects two queries. One to retrieve the nodes in the graph, the first query here, and that is the nodes in the graph, it's the circles, and another one to retrieve the edges in the graph, and that is the arrows. And so this is the query to get the list of nodes, and basically we just retrieve all service names that appeared in spans in the currently selecting selected time window in Grafana. ID and title, are two parameters the node graph expects. ID uniquely identifies a node and title is the label that is assigned to the node. And so we're using service name in both cases. The second query is more interesting and it has to return the arrows, so the relationships in between the services. This is actually something that is typically or usually impossible with the limited query language that other observability backends provide. But because we can leverage the full capabilities of SQL provided by PostgreSQL, we can do joins. And in this case, we join the span view, the span view with itself to identify parent and child. We're using K here for kid. So identify parent and child spans that are related to each other. To do that, we have to check that the span ID of the parent is the same 
as the parent span ID of the child span. We add two additional conditions. So the first one is not strictly needed, but what we're doing here is we're ensuring that both the parent and the child span are part of the same trace ID. And this would only make sense in cases where there are two spans that were assigned the same span ID, which is very unlikely to happen. The other condition, the one at the bottom, is actually very important because it ensures that we only look at parent-child relationships across services. That is, a service operation calling an operation in another service. And so we remove inter-service relationships. That is, an operation in a service calling another operation in the same service, because we don't want to show those in this map where we're interested in uh, cross-service dependencies. This table here shows the same relationships as the service map, but in a table in a table format with some additional stats. So you can see we have you know number of calls, total execution time, and average execution time. If we look at the query behind, it's the same. So in this case, as I said, this is a table. We're showing a table, so this is a table panel, uh, Grafana's table panel, and the query pretty much uses the same join, okay? So it's very similar, it uses the same join, but we're showing, you know, a set of different stats. So we're grouping by uh, source, target, and uh, span name. So that, that's the grouping that we're using. And then we're showing how many calls are happening from the source to this source service, to this target service and uh, operation. And um, the total execution time of, um, you know, that was spent, so we just sum uh, uh, these spans, and we just compute how much uh, time has been spent in this specific operation across all the spans within the selected time window, and then the average execution of that uh, of that span. And so here, very quickly, we can see that you know most of the time is actually spent uh, in the generator calling the lower service, the lower service calling the digit service, and the generator calling the digit service. So I mean. It seems to be that the problem is actually in the digit service. That's a service that is very slow. And um, I think we already saw that, you know, when we looked at the um, traces, at the specific trace, and we saw that a lot of time was spent in the digit service. So this is just, you know, reinforcing that. Uh, and that is not just an individual occurrence, most likely, but this is happening uh, consistently across uh, or over time and across uh, multiple requests. So we're now going to take a look at another way to explore and visualize trace data. So again, we're going to be using the node graph panel. But in this case, we're trying to solve a different problem. Imagine then that one of uh, your services is unexpectedly going through a high increase in load. And understanding where that load is coming from in a microservices environment is not easy because you would need to check all the different upstream services that end up calling the service under pressure. So let's select a different service here. Let's go, for example, for the digit service. And so if we look at the digit service and the, you know, the, the slash, which is the entry point operation, which is here, we see in this tree, we see that you know this is being called by the generator. Um, uh, it's called by the generator through it. You know, it gets it's a HTTP GET request to the service, but it's also called by the lowest service. And we see that uh, this is you know that there is a you know digit operation in the lowest service that is uh, end up calling digit, which is I mean we already saw in the service map that is probably wrong. But the thing that is interesting as well is that it's quite a bit of load going to that service through this path, okay? So it's, you know, close to half of the load is generated via this path and half of the rest of the load, you know, will be generated by this path, which is the correct one. So we see that this digit service is probably under pressure with doubling the amount of work it needs to do uh, because we have, you know, so there's some something wrong in our code in this case. And again, I mean, we could have 
you know, a lot of other hopes, you know, in the uh, tree of spans or operations until we hit the service and we could use this visualization to quickly spot um, where most of the requests are coming from. Again, the number here uh, inside what we're doing is showing the total count of spans for that specific operation or uh, what is the same saying the same thing is the total number of times that operation has been executed uh, in the selected time window, which in this case is 15 minutes. And so again, as I said, we're using the node graph panel and we have again the two queries. Since those two queries are a bit long, I'm going to move to a text editor to review them. So the first thing to note is that, you know, doing this kind of thing, like going up, you know, in the chain of calls is something that would be very tedious. You know, if you had to do this without a powerful query language, because basically we need to recursively traverse the tree of spans up across all traces that involve our problematic service. And so, you know, luckily, you know, we can leverage the power of SQL again. And in this case, what we use is a recursive query. Okay, so we use this construct, a recursive query. And the way it works is that there is an initial query that will get executed, which is this one. And we see, you know, service and operation are the ones that you selected from the drop downs in Grafana. And we, it runs this query, which is retrieving basically all spans. You know, uh, you know, some data for all spans that match this uh, specific service and operation. And then it runs the results. So X, you know, are, are the results from this initial query. It runs them through this other query. And basically what this is doing is a, a join where it checks that X, so the, um, uh, the results from uh, the, 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 it looks at the results from the original query, reads the parent span ID, and then it checks for, you know, this uh, new table that we're joining again, which is again the same, you know, span view um, uh, table, if you want. It collects, it, it looks at uh, comparing and ensure that we retrieve the parents. Okay, so basically S in this case will represent the parent of X. So we're going up one level and we're projecting all these different values from the parent span. And because this is recursive, it will do the same thing again. So it will take the results that we just got, these results here, and run this query again against it again. So it will do, again, the recursive thing. It will check, okay, so I have to look at this. Uh, the, the values that I have, I inject them, you know, I inject them into X here. And again, we look for, okay, for each of the spans that were returned here, let's look for the parents, okay? And let's retrieve the parent spans. And we do that again and again and again until there are no results returned, okay? So this is how this recursiveness works. And once it has built, you know, that table, because you see this union all is just appending all those results, the results from the first query and all the subsequent queries that is are navigating um, upstream, you know, through the spans. It runs uh, on those results, it runs this query, okay, which is doing, okay, uh, returning, uh, using a span as uh, the service name and the span name, the operation to generate an, an ID. So this is, will be, we're generating one node for each service name and a span name. Something important to notice here is that we're not excluding inter-service operations because we're actually interested in seeing them in case the increase in calls was coming from an internal operation within the service and not generated from something outside. It could be maybe something wrong, you know, a new deployment that we made and maybe cause that problem. So, so we're not excluding and we're actually including inter-service operations as well. And then we add service name as a subtitle, you know, of uh, the node. So we had a span name as a title of the node, service name as a subtitle of the node. And then we're counting the number uh, of spans, the number, and we use this thing just in place the, the you know, span ID for some reason during this recursive operation created some duplicates. In theory, I don't think that's necessarily needed, but just in case we use this thing so that we remove any, any potential duplicates there and we have an accurate count. And, uh, and then, so we, and then what we do is we grouping, you know, those results by service name and span name. So that basically grouping by node. So these are, this is a query for the nodes and the edges uses a very similar uh, query, but 
so again, you see this join here where it's traversing app, you know, from the current set of results. Let's get the parents and project them. But it also adds a bunch of uh, additional information because in here we're interested in the uh, edges. So we're project projecting the, um, the ID for their relationship, which is, you know, service name, span name from the source uh, to the uh, service name and the span name of the child. So that is, you know, the relationship between two nodes, essentially, in the um, graph that we're displaying. And then we also are doing the um, uh, target and source. We're using uh, the MD, you know, again, we're doing an MD5 on the service name and, and a span name, again, to compute IDs for those. Um, and then we just project here again the same thing where we're projecting is the target, uh, the ID, the target, and the source. You know, so the uh, the node panel can actually connect the dots between the uh, the services. So they need to, we need to use the same ID in here for targeted source. We it's constructed as you can see the same way it was constructed in the node. So that you know again the node graph panel can identify those um, those nodes and make the connection with an arrow. Okay, so we saw we've seen how we can troubleshoot scenarios where you know we have a service that is having some issues, you know, and we can actually navigate up through the stream of uh, through the uh, sequence of spans in all across all the different traces to understand the uh, how did how this service is being called you know what's the impact of things happening upstream into the service we're uh, looking at we can do something similar but in this case using downstream spans okay so let me let me make this bigger and this is showing again here i have selected uh, generator and HTTP get. Uh, so let's actually select generator and the generate uh, uh, operation because that is the entry point. And so this is showing an entire map of all the requests, you know, that go through the service. What are all the different services and operations that are being called, you know, and how often they are, etc. And we're using the same technique that we use in the upstream span or action dependencies dashboard. The only difference is that in this case, the join is the other way around. Okay, so we're looking, before we had the X pattern span ID equals S span ID. So here is, is the other way around. So we're looking for X span ID um, uh, being the same as the uh, pattern span ID. So we're just going you know, downstream. Okay, and then we project the children and then again, we do the same uh, same operation here. So it's a very very similar thing. So I will not explain it in detail. But you can just show you can navigate upstream. But you could also navigate downstream, and you know this gives you a very interesting map of all the uh, different calls that happen in the service across you know the you know, in this case the last fifteen minutes. Once uh, you know for for all the requests to the generator service. So it helps you understand in detail at the end of the day what's happening. You know how how are all the different requests being processed? Another thing that I'll explain here in this dashboard that is interesting as well is this one, and this one is looking at the total execution time by operation, but it's not doing this just by blindly adding up the duration of all spans for that specific operation is actually looking at time actually spent in the code of that operation. That is, it is subtracting the time spent in child spans. Okay, so you have an operation, it has some code, and then it makes requests to other operations that have their, you know, that are tracked in their own spans. So instead of l telling you that, you know, the, the, um, the high level span is the one that is taking the longest. No, it's actually looking at how much time is spent within that the code of that span 
and um, so that you can identify where the bottleneck is because otherwise it, it will always the one that is at the top of the hierarchy will be the one that shows as being the slowest but here it's not the case you know if you see this query the slowest one where most of the time is spent and we already have seen this you know over the course of this uh, presentation is the digit random digit method or function is where most of the time is spent 88 percent of the time is spent there so definitely this is the first place we should go to optimize the performance of our service if we didn't be subtracting uh, time from child spans the one at the top would have been the generate um, password from the uh, generator service because that's the top level one and so all the time is adding up into the duration of that span so how do we do that this is actually really important you know it's this idea of okay i'm looking at where specifically in which uh, code is specifically the time is spent and by doing this subtraction of okay the parent span duration i re I, I subtract the time is spanning the children, then I get the actual uh, execution time within that that specific uh, code. It's really helpful to understand bottlenecks. And the way we do it is again, we use, it's the same thing again, we use a recursive query to traverse all the spans and assign time to the different um, actual time span, you know, in the different spans. And what we do is this thing that you see here. This is the key, this is the key thing. And what it's doing is subtracting to the parent span duration is subtracting the sum of the duration of all the children. Okay, so it's looking where um, the span ID, you know, this this span here is the uh, parent. Okay, so so it's subtracting all this time. And coalesce, what it's doing is if this return null, so no data, it just says it's zero. So it basically doesn't. There is, there is no number. You don't need to subtract any time. To the duration. It, this is only useful for um, leaf spans, you know, that don't have any children. All right, so we've reached the end of the this webinar. I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, we showed that with OpenTelemetry, PromSkill, and Grafana, you can get insights you didn't think, I don't think you would think you thought were possible, thanks to the power of full SQL. I encourage all of you to download the OpenTelemetry demo today. All the software we've shown here is available on GitHub and it's free to use. And if you have questions about PromSkill or the demo environment, we're available in the PromSkill channel in our Slack community that we see that you see here. Uh, I just wanted to take the time to thank you for, uh, for uh, watching this webinar and I hope to see you on our Slack community soon.